Okay, well, thanks, Deb, and welcome to, uh, to everyone. Here we go again with InfoHealth. I just realized, thinking about it over lunch, I think this is the 15th year of InfoHealth. That's a long time for any program to go. And this has really been an odd year. Uh, for about 10 years of that, Big Master has been part of it, the Niagara part of the program. So, and uh, I've had a talk with the Dean and uh, they'll re-engage in January of next year. But they've had a really chaotic time as, I, as have most medical schools and even residencies uh, in this COVID period. But, uh, but just having a thought here, so the InfoHealth program, it's a once a month one, and it's usually on the second Wednesday of each month. So it's memorable, it's easy to remember. You don't have to remember a date. And it's usually in the afternoon at uh, 2 p.m., but that's negotiable. So, so if you have another time that would work better for you, then uh, this is a time to reinvent ourselves. Um, so today I'm doing balance and falls, but um, uh, because it's a, it, it is a major problem, but uh, uh, we're going to continue through the summer see how that goes. And, um, and so the next one is going to be on lower back pain and uh, lumbar stenosis. Uh, anyone who lives in this community recognizes that balance of falls and, and lumbar stenosis and lower back pain uh, goes with, uh, with aging, or at least with the demographic here. Um, and then we're going to do the equivalent uh, of looking at the same degenerative process in the neck in, in July, then in August, uh, we're either going to revisit strokes, which is uh, a lot has happened since we looked at that before. Um, and then um, let's see. And then in September, it is certainly time to do gene editing again, because uh, a whole lot has happened uh, after Jennifer Dudna's uh, book and uh, Nobel Prize last year uh, of a very practical nature. Uh, so we need to review that. And then um, at the end of today's program, I'm going to introduce a couple of cases because I wouldn't mind trying out a case-centered approach. And we would send out the, um, the material uh, beforehand, a week before. Uh, so everyone will have the same material and you could be a sleuth and try to figure it out yourself. But, but I think it's a good way of looking at the healthcare system, uh, all the kind of moving parts of the healthcare system. Um, and that's certainly true of the two cases that will come up at the end of this program if we have time. Uh, so that'll be an experimental thing to do. Well, let's uh, get going. And um, you may recognize this because uh, this was in the Lake Report, and Penny Lynn Cookson uh, reviewed this uh, artist and this particular painting. And I thought, gee, uh, well, if this was, uh, if there was a pandemic in 1876, the looks on their faces would be very appropriate, wouldn't it? And um, anyway, it's a, it's a beautiful painting. There's much that we could say about that, but um, we'll move on. Well, uh, just looking at the numbers, um, I was a little staggered by these numbers when I, when I reviewed them, because the evidence suggests that a fall, a fall will occur at least once a year um, in people who are 70 and over, 30% of them, 30% of the time. See, that's, that's a pretty high frequency. And two or more falls a year, around 10%. Uh, that's worrisome because some of these end up with fractures and dislocations and, and sprains or strains. The other thing that's often forgotten is that some people who have had uh, one or more falls uh, were really scared by it or, and, um, and there's a fear of falling. And they, they begin to limit their social life and how much they get around. And, um, and, and they don't often fess up to their family physician uh, or even their friends about that. So, so it clearly has an impact quite aside from the fractures or the physical injuries. And uh, no surprise, uh, about a third of a million 
uh, Canadians show up in emergency rooms a year because of falls. Now, um, let's deal with some of the some of the risk factors. As we get older, and this and there, there's no real there, there's no way of changing the loss of nerve cells of the brain and spinal cord. It it, it seems to be that that the that the rate of decline or loss of nerve cells in the in the brain and spinal cord is very very slow, beginning around say 45 50, but then in that between 60 and 70 it really starts to speed up, and that explains a lot of things that go on uh, with us as as far as weakness goes, but also some Parkinsonian like symptoms that uh, we develop, uh, not necessarily Parkinson's disease, but, but some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. We also lose muscle mass, uh, and that's losing muscle fibers. And there's no training that you can do that's going to bring back those muscle fibers any more than it will bring back the nerve cells. But we'll talk about that later. You can actually change the muscle fibers. And osteopenia and, and the associated increased risk of fractures. So, um, just looking at the next slide, um, kind of falls waiting to happen. The prevalence of home hazards. Well, listen, when we were uh, in our 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, we didn't think of any of these home hazards, did we? We didn't think about a loose carpet or, or a little pet kind of scampering out in front of us because. Even if they did and we tripped, we caught ourselves most of the time and we didn't injure ourselves. But those are the same hazards that are there now. And, um, and we add to them some of the sequelae of the, of the nerve cell loss and, and, uh, and muscle fiber loss in some of the later things or things that are listed below that, the balance impairment because of degenerative changes in the cerebellum. Uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. It kind of explains some of the troubles walking. Another one is uh, a, a drop in blood pressure. Anything, if, if the blood pressure drops more than 10 or 20 millimeters of mercury and stays that way for two or three minutes, you have a problem. And, uh, and it may be medication induced, but, but it's something that is easily checked. Uh, in these days with COVID and uh, not getting into physician's office, it's, uh, it's maybe something that needs being checked and isn't being checked. Um, activities of daily living. Uh, I mean, when do a lot of these accidents occur? Well, they often occur getting dressed, undressed, in the shower, getting in and out of the tub. All of those things that we all took for granted for two thirds of our life, but we can't take for granted any longer. And, uh, and, uh, and so a lot of people put handles in strategic places, but, but that's certainly, we need to think about that. Visual impairment, we'll say some more about that later. Anyone with a cognitive impairment, uh, whatever the nature of that type of dementia, um, that's a risk factor for, for falls, for sure. Now, here's an easy test you can try at home. I, this is in the Lake Report, but the so-called tug test. So uh, have someone with you to watch you and catch you if something happens, but sit in a chair, an upright chair, and, uh, and measure out a distance from the chair of 10 feet or three meters. That's the line that you have to get to. And, and then um, the timing starts when you start to sit up. That moment, clock starts. And that's without your arms pushing you off. So getting up from a chair without the assist of your arm, walking to that 10 meter or at least three meter line or 10 foot line, crossing the line, turning around, coming back and sitting down. Normal is 12 seconds or less. I've tried this out on myself and um, I'm somewhere around 11 and 12 seconds. That's after I did a little training. But uh, so you might want to try that out on yourself, but it's a good way of picking up uh, early, early problems. Uh, there are certainly high risk uh, medications. 
uh, sedatives for sure, antidepressants, uh, the benzodiazepines. Alcohol in this region is big because uh, with all the wineries around and, uh, and the happy hours and the, the uh, it's not surprising that becomes uh, an issue. So um, now we've already talked about some of these, some of the in-home things, slick floors, uh, you know, the water spilled on the floor or something and cooking, loose carpets and edges. If, um, uh, I, I, I think almost 80% of the people at Niagara on the Lake of a certain age have a, have a dog and, uh, or maybe it's 70%, but, uh, and usually on the small side and they get underfoot. I mentioned stairs because one of the problems is uh, many of us wear bifocals and the steps aren't in focus when we look down. So we're going down steps and then to add it, we're often carrying something, the laundry down, and we can't actually see the stairs uh, well. And that's really an accident waiting to happen. So some people suggest that, that for most activity, you have a pair of glasses that are for distance only, and that will pick that and, and that will work for those stairs. And then if you're going to read, well, then put on the reading glasses. But that's certainly an issue and people don't think about it. Um, so that's something to, to consider. And uh, my golden rule is if, you, if you're carrying stuff, it's laundry or whatever it is you're carrying up and down stairs or out on the street or your driveway, if you can't see the floor, then don't carry it that way. Uh, try a backpack or carry it in your arms, but don't. Uh, don't block your view. And the other thing is that uh, your shoes should have a nice grippy sole and ankle support because uh, ankles turning uh, is a common cause of falls and fracture. Right? And um, so that's something to be aware of. Now, another thing that happens as we get older is we become less active. So part of this is about um, uh, strength training, and um, and for people who are relatively, and by the way, you don't have to be inactive for very long. If you're admitted to an ICU unit, I can guarantee that your muscles start to break down within a day. Uh, so that it doesn't take long for this breakdown of muscle protein to begin. Uh, so, uh, and you do have to work at maintaining it. Uh, I'm not going to say anything more about that, but something about balance. Uh, now, we cover this in the brain series. There are, um, there are receptors that provide us with position sense, and oddly enough, they're in muscles. They're not in the joint. And these receptors... Um, that you may, uh, you may remember, they're called spindles, muscle spindles, but they measure the length of a muscle and the rate of a change of length of the muscle. So they provide that uh, up and down sensitivity. If I'm moving your toe up and down, uh, they provide that position sense. Joint receptors per se, uh, uh, there are very few of them and they're not all that sensitive. And that's supported by the fact that if you replace the hip joint or the knee joint or both, people still have quite good position sets. So if, if the position sets is coming from the joint itself, um, that would seem to be evidence that it's uh, probably not a uh, much more than a minor contribution. And your training program should include something for balance. So uh, now we can't all look like Dara Torres, uh, this is, uh, Dara was 41 here, and she got on the, uh, the American Olympic swimming team. And I think, uh, if memory serves me right, uh, within a few months of this picture being taken and the Olympics, she had a child. And uh, she was determined to get on the team, and you could see that she's really, really fit. Uh, Interestingly enough, as fit as she is and as hard as she worked at it, she certainly wasn't going to match 
uh, people in their late teens and in their early 20s, you know, most Olympic uh, uh, swimmers, especially the sprinters, uh, they're young. The same is true in track events. And so that erosion of our motor skills and ability really is beginning in our 20s, uh, probably in our mid-20s, late, certainly later 20s. And um, it's, uh, it's a little less apparent with endurance events. So despite all of her effort here, uh, I don't think she made it actually to the Olympics uh, competitively. Um, so that's to make you feel better. Now, what are the goals of an exercise program? To increase your strength and flexibility and the endurance. And, and that's with a program that you can do at home. I'm gonna to get to that in a bit. But it's also an increase the flexibility and strength of tendons. After all, your muscles and tendons work as a unit. And if you had to single out muscle groups, it would be the trunk, so-called core muscles, and lower limb muscles. How often? Well, the book says three to five days a week, uh, about a half an hour or 40 minutes. Um, um, I, I think there's reasonable consensus on all of that. I mean, that's what you should try to do. Now, there's no, about, no doubt about the, the training effects of uh, on, on muscle. Within a few weeks, the increase in, in, um, in strength is, all, is apparent in muscles, particularly with resistance training. Oddly enough, eccentric contractions, that is contract, when you're extending the arm, extending the arm, for example, against re resistance, when you're lengthening a muscle, uh, that has more of an effect on training than um, shortening the muscle against resistance. And, and the training effect certainly shows up with some enlargement of the muscle. But as I said earlier, it's not because you get any new muscle fibers, but the contractile elements, the hundreds of those elements within the muscle fibers, they do increase. And so uh, also does the blood supply to your skeletal muscles in your trunk and limbs and neck, uh, but, uh, um, but also your heart. Now, it, now, something about learning. Um, uh, the brain is plastic, but it's never more plastic than in those first few years of life. Now, I mentioned this in the brain series. Many motor skills are already in place uh, at birth. The sucking, breathing, eye movements, all of those movements. That no child needs any training for that. No child needs needs uh, training for oral language or acquiring a culture, that kind of, as long as the environment is there, they'll soak it up. And, uh, and just as they, with that, I mentioned with uh, Jacob Bernowski, that series, The Ascent of Man, it has that remarkable series showing a child uh, uh, first lifting their head and then rolling over and sitting up, pulling themselves up, standing, uh, taking the first steps, walking and running, that all happens without formal teaching. Learning to write is a whole other matter. That's a very intentional and effortful activity. Learning is paralleled by de a developmental maturation of the brain in the young, meaning the parts of the brain that are used actually develop more connections, more synapses, if you like, and the area of the cortex hypertrophies or becomes thicker. So we already covered that in the, in the brain series. Now, um, I pushed this so many times. Now, Miriam Nelson was a colleague in, in Boston, and I noticed she's still quite active. But as far as I'm concerned, um, they put together the most practical, effective training program uh, for women. It was del deliberately developed for women. And then later, men felt left out and, and, uh, and, and were included. But, but this was 
done so that people could do it in their own home. It could be a nursing home, it could be their own home, but without special tools. So it used kind of furniture that it, it, it needed kind of added resistance. And, and the program really worked. I mean, this I think was one of the few times that three major universities at Boston actually worked together and did this trial. I think it went on for almost 10 years. Uh, and in some form or another, it may still be going on. So it was Tufts University, Harvard, and Boston University. I went online and in fact, parts of it are still going on. And they, that training program started with women in their 20s and it ran through uh, women in their 90s. And they realized increases in strength of the order of uh, anywhere from 20 to 50%. That's really quite significant. And that's quite a reduction in risk of falling or tripping. So it's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, by the way, uh, and I've just Googled that and, uh, and the, the books all pop up. Uh, now, excuses for not exercising. Well, here are the common ones. I don't have time. I don't like to sweat. I don't know what exercises work. I don't know how to use the equipment if it happens to be a gym. Uh, I feel worse and it hurts after I exercise. I don't watch, uh, want others watching me. And again, that, that's the gym phenomenon. I have a medical condition. My mother lived to 100 and never exercised. I get enough exercise around the house. And then you can fill in your excuse at the bottom or your list of them. But those are the usual, none of which should be paid any attention to, in my view. Um, Remember when you're training muscles, you're training the brain, the two are being trained at the same time. So any uh, novel uh, motor activity, it may, perhaps you haven't been using a bicycle for years. Uh, um, and uh, it's been very interesting in, in uh, total here, the number of uh, bikes that are around, much more than it was say a year ago. And, and, that, and that's very good, but it's a, it, you know, that was an activity that was probably done in the, up to the kind of early 20s and then not revisited until recently. But any new motor activity takes a little time to learn for the nerve cells to kind of organize themselves. And what initially happens uh, is the brain kind of draws on, a, it recruits neurons from a wide area. And it increasingly focuses the recruitment of the motor nerve cells and the movements become more and more precise. And one of the interesting things is that the training of the central nervous system begins immediately. Of course, that's true. Just, uh, I mean, I think about it in my own example because I learned to ski late, meaning uh, in my late 20s. And um, I remember Jan and others kind of taking me through the ropes in the first uh, few days. But it, you know, within half an hour or an hour, you are learning to do it better. So that's brain training. That's not muscle training, that's brain training. So from the get go, you're, you are actually teaching the brain how to, in that case, ski or whatever else you're thinking about doing. Um, the muscle effects, the changes in the muscle, they actually take several weeks. So even though the, the, your, the, the power you generate, the strength that you, can gen, that you can generate seems to increase within a week or two, that's because of a smarter brain, not because the muscles actually change. The changes in the muscle kind of kick in later. So, um, so they don't learn or change at the same time. Now, something about neurological causes of falls. I mentioned that sentry ataxia as well. Think about it. This is any um, uh, problem that affects those sentry fibers, say from the muscle spindles that provide joint position. And therefore, uh, to the brain and the cerebellum, the information about where the limb is and what the limb's doing exactly. Um, and where would we see this? Well, sometimes we see this with uh, vitamin deficiencies, particularly the B vitamins, vitamin E deficiency. 
um, for sure. Um, but we also see that some people on cancer chemotherapeutic drugs, a regular victim of, of uh, some of those drugs is knocking out some of the large sensory fibers that carry physician sense. So, um, so they're, they're actually common. So you really do have to, we as physicians and nurses need to examine that. Um, a clue there is, is when people lose their tendon reflexes. Or if you check whether somebody knows whether their toe is going up or down, that they don't, or they're having trouble, that would be something to think about. And, it, and, and it's pretty obvious that anyone who develops uh, a loss of nerve cells in the brain, the motor nerve cells that we spent some time on in the brain series, and the motor nerve cells in the spinal cord, those losses are associated with weakness and, um, and an increased risk of falling. And I put in cervical and lumbosacral spondylosis because degenerative diseases, uh, diseases in the neck and the lumbosacral region, those are the most mobile regions in the whole spine, and therefore the regions of the spine uh, uh, most liable to, to, to develop these degenerative changes. And that would be fine if there was lots of room for the spinal cord and the nerve roots. But the problem is with these degenerative changes in the spine and the, and the neck, and especially the lower back, um, they, that those degenerative changes crowd the spinal cord in the neck or the exit parameter or the holes through which nerve roots go. And, uh, and not only cause pain and discomfort, but, uh, but weakness. Uh, certainly any of the movement disorders, by far the most common one is Parkinson's disease. There's often a giveaway to this. Uh, you know, um, after a few years of practice, you could almost recognize it coming through the door because you notice that they're not swinging an arm on one side, or perhaps the right leg is slower to move than the left leg. Or you look at them and gee, they're not smiling as that have a flat face that uh, they don't show the same emotional response in their face. Or their voice becomes kind of muted, muffled without the normal kind of modulation. So even before you've examined the person or, or um, taken a history, you kind of know. The other one, progressive supranuclear palsy, um, that's one actually that was described in Canada by Richardson and company in Toronto. And um, one of its early features is a loss of automatic and voluntary eye movement. So you can see where this would be a risk factor for falling because if you can't look down, you can't see where you're going. So you're more liable to trip and fall. So one of the things you need to check as a, as a neurologist would be ocular movement to see if they actually can look down. Um, Louis body dementia, we won't get into that. There's a whole, it's interesting from my training days when there were only a few causes recognized of cerebellar ataxia and I think uh, alcohol was by far the most common one. There are, um, probably a hundred or more different causes now. And we recognize many of them are genetically transmitted and then show up in later life as a difficulty, uh, unsteadiness and walking. And then uh, some people with, uh, uh, with cognitive disorders, especially those that affect the frontal lobe have trouble walking. And there's in one of the case examples, I'm going to show you, there's an example of that. Now, I've already alluded to the visual disorders here. People, um, you can imagine uh, your central vision, that's where you see color that extends out about 15 or 20 degrees out from the center, uh, the kind of photoreceptors for, for color. Um, so that, that provides you with your reading, this kind of discriminative vision. And then the peripheral vision way out here on the side where you can kind of pick up movement, but you're not quite sure what. And um, uh, 
Uh, it's one of the things I know as a pilot, I was taught that, uh, look, keep your head moving. Because if you want to pick up traffic, don't count on, on, your, on, the, on your central vision picking it up. You'll pick up the movement before you actually see it as an airplane. So that's an interesting little clue. We've already talked about the ocular movement stuff and the problem with bifocals. I actually have trifocals, which makes it even worse. And that's really because of the flying business. So I can read, but also see the panel out here and all in the distance. So I'm thinking about changing that. Now here is the most common cause of dizziness related to the, to the vestibular system, benign positional vertical. And the key to recognizing this is that people will say, gee, when I, when I sit up or I lie down or I roll over, I'm momentarily off balance. And it only lasts for a few seconds or maybe at the most a minute or so. And if I stop, uh, just pause, it goes away. Uh, sometimes it could be quite uh, violent. I remember one um, person I knew in Nodal here, uh, who was in her early 80s and was walking down the main street and she had a history of this. And, uh, and all of a sudden she was, she described it as being thrown against the, the wall that she was kind of walking past. So sometimes the vestibular response is really quite strong. And, uh, but there's no change in hearing. This is strictly a vestibular symptom. It's, uh, it's relatively brief and it's produced by critical positions of the head or movement of the head. And um, unfortunately, it can be treated uh, quite well in the office with a so-called Epley maneuver. Um, and this is, it, it's really caused by one of the, the receptors in, inside these, uh, in, inside the vestibular system are kind of dotted with uh, sand-like particles on the top and they kind of fall off and they get into parts of the semicircular canals where they shouldn't be. And the whole idea of this Epley maneuver is to get those little bits of sand, if you like, back and stuck in their original place. Well, whether that actually happens or not, I'm not sure, but does the maneuver work? It does. And, uh, and, and, um, and, and once taught, uh, you can fix it uh, if you're traveling. It's not a big deal. You don't have to see a physician or anyone else. Now, Meniere's disease is less common but the giveaway here is that dizziness lasts longer and it's associated with a plugged or stuffed uh, feeling in the ear and hearing loss. So this one affects hearing and the vestibular function as well. Um, actually, I had a word with my son who is an ENT about this and, and um, benign positional vertigo. Um, so I'll make some comments a little bit later uh, what he contributed to that. Now, some other things about other causes of vertigo or the sense of being off balance. Uh, sometimes uh, some people describe it as like being on a ship uh, or a sense of seasickness. And um, uh, there is one form of migraine, which incidentally was described by Miller Fisher, who was, uh, it was he's dead now, uh, was a Canadian, uh, ended up in, at Harvard, and became one of the one of the U.S.'s best neurologists. And he described this Basler migraine phenomenon, meaning that the the migraine seemed to affect the vessels that supplied the uh, the brainstem and the cerebellum and the visual cortex. And for those of you who are at the brain series you might have remembered that there was a functional MRI study, which was done and showed that uh, coincident with uh, patients reporting those uh, little prickles of light, sparkles of light, zigzags of light around the periphery, uh, the brain lit up in the corresponding area of the brain and it kind of marched across the surface of the brain for the 10 or 15 minutes uh, in which the 
during which the patient had the symptom. So a very nice uh, picture of what's act, what was actually happening in the brain. We're gonna talk about posterior fossa tumors in a second, and uh, you can ignore the last for a moment. Well, here's a, an example of somebody with, uh, uh, with a stroke affecting the, the brain stem. So there's my pointer down there. If it's white, it's, it, that's the infarct or the destroyed part of the brain. This whole region is the cerebellum. This is the right side of the cerebellum, the left side of the cerebellum. But it also affects the brain stem. It affects the brain stem on the right side as well as the cerebellum. And both of those regions are supplied by the uh, posterior inferior cerebellar artery. So we know exactly which artery was plugged to cause this syndrome. Um, so that's a, a case of an ischemic stroke. Uh, as bad as that looks, uh, many patients recover functionally quite well after that. Now you can see why things that happen in the posterior fossa, meaning uh, the back part of the brain, the cerebellum and the brain stem. Uh, I mean, this is Grand Central Station. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through all of the anatomy here, but uh, it's enough that you see that you're perplexed with all of the little nerves that you see. And, um, but you can, just on the, the right side of my picture, there's a large uh, schwannoma or a benign tumor uh, that grew on the vestibular nerve. And, um, and you can see it's displaced the brain stem to the other side. It, it's displaced the cerebellum, but you know, it's one, you all right? Okay. Oh, you're changing my that. Oh, oh, that's much better. Okay. Oh, there we are. It's help, helpful to have a red dot that we can actually see. So anyway, that's the tumor right there. Now, um, there's a bit of history here. When I learned uh, clinical neurology and neurosurgery to some extent back in the late 60s um, and early 70s, uh, the mark of excellence in a neurosurgeon was his, and it was almost always in those days of his, his ability to take out big tumors in the back in this posterior fossa. These things are, are massive. They pro probably developed over many years. The patient might not actually have many symptoms. That's one of the amazing things. If things have, I've said to, the, uh, to several of you, this before, if things happen slowly in the nervous system, there may be few, if any, symptoms, even if the lesion is very large. And I've, I've, the first time I saw this was a, was a young man with uh, epilepsy. And in the early 1970s, just when the CAT scan was coming in and he had no abnormal neurological findings, his electroencephalogram showed some minor abnormalities. And I was just knocked off my seat when I saw the CAT scan because he had a huge tumor involving the right side of his brain from the front to the back. And uh, it's starting to move across the, the midline, but it obviously developed over a long, long period of time. And so he had very few symptoms to show for. It. And obviously, um, uh, uh, far too big for any surgeon to even think about fixing. And, um, and he lived for, for many years after that without much in the way of symptoms and with well-controlled epileptic seizures. So I just mentioned that because uh, it may be because of its size, a formidable thing for a surgeon to, to take on. But these days, this is much more likely what's happened because these are these days, this break brings up some issues here because, because of a high tech technology, MRI and contrast CT scans, you can pick up really small schwannoma. I mean, there's a little tiny one here. And, uh, and some of these are picked up by chance because the, the MRI or CT scan were carried out 
for some other reason, maybe the investigation of a headache, something like that. And then lo and behold, up pops uh, a tumor or a tiny little one like here, or maybe a little bit larger one here. Here's a big one down here. The cyst like the one in the diagram or drawing that I showed you just minutes ago. But tumors of this size uh, really raise the question whether you should do anything about it at all because these progress very slowly. And the risk of you doing damage to other to brainstem structures or other cranial nerve is substantial. So it's not as if surgery is an easy thing to do. Uh, it gets at this whole issue of picking up lesions early, perhaps earlier than they should actually be dealt with. Uh, particularly given the fact that many of these are found in people our age. So we're not picking them up in somebody in their 20s where they're likely to give, get them into trouble kind of uh, 30 or 40 years later. So that's, that's a takeaway point here. And, um, and then uh, I remember in, when I was in London, uh, before I headed off to Boston, there was a great thing about getting a so-called gamma knife uh, using uh, very focused radiation to treat uh, small tumors to avoid the necessity of going in there and actually physically taking out the, 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 uh, the tumor. And, uh, and um, you know, fashions catch on and the gamma knives or their equivalent became something that every neurosurgical department wanted. But do they actually need it? And, um, and, and sometimes um, uh, I have seen some things go wrong with the gamma knife, but it, but it all depends on, on experience. How often, how many cases do they actually see and how are they, how are they uh, followed, that kind of thing. But anyway, but certainly technologically speaking, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a way of avoiding physical surgery and replacing that with, uh, with a remote radiation surgery. Um, and we're not gonna get into this, but surgeons like to talk about this because these are three different approaches. I spent about an hour with my son last night talking about these different approaches because these days it's a team. So a dura surgeon and a base of skull surgeon and an ear, nose, and throat surgeon all working together to, and, and that dictates the approach. So um, the other thing that, that um, you know that there are cochlear implants for people with deafness, um, well, they've come along with uh, uh, implants for vestibular system. That is, if, if the vestibular nerve has been destroyed, uh, can its function be in part uh, on, offset, the, the dysfunction, by uh, implanting um, uh, something to kind of selectively stimulate what's left of the vestibular system? Uh, my sense of it at this point is that this is very early in the game. And um, and I wouldn't be thinking about that. Now I've come to these to these uh, cases because here's this is the kind of thing that we're going to maybe spend a, a half an hour or forty minutes on it later in the year. But I've abbreviated here. So here's uh, and this is the way they're reported. And the in, in this case it happens to be the New England Journal of Medicine, but the Lancet, BMJ and other journals do the same thing. But here's the case. Um, a 70 year old woman with rapidly progressive unsta ataxia, unsteadiness, loss of balance. And it's a three month history. So that's short, stuff is happening. And she was a retired educator. She traveled extensively in the US and Europe. Uh, she was a fitness person, daily yoga, aerobics, and dance classes. So she certainly looked after herself uh, cognitively and, uh, and physically. But within three months, she developed marked loss of, loss of balance. And, um, and 
when they did an electroencephalogram, there was one little short wave uh, recorded from one side of the brain, the left parietal region, I think. So three month history, that was when they first saw her. Then just three weeks later, in three weeks, she's, her walking is profoundly worse. Wide base, quite, a, quite a, uh, unstable. Her voice is thick. Her eye movements are jerky, what's called ataxia. And she has what, uh, what uh, neurologists would call a, a cerebellar disorder plus. Um, now, there are other things that could cause this. And uh, sometimes uh, bismuth or manganese or mercury, but probably a more common one that people run into these days is an autoimmune disorder where people develop a, an inflammatory uh, disorder primarily affecting the cerebellum and its connections, but it's an autoimmune disorder. Um, and sometimes that's associated as a remote effect of some cancers. So, so something to, to think about. Well, uh, the other one is you may have followed the news out of New Brunswick of uh, this odd neurological disorder um, and uh, uh, people developing uh, presumably a, looks seems like a, uh, a, a neurodegenerative disorder uh, without a label yet. But my betting is it's related to this. This is this here is an example of a prion disease. Two Nobel Prizes were awarded for prions. First of all, to show they existed. And number two, the, uh, how it actually worked. And um, but these are these are infectious diseases, but not caused by anything with RNA or DNA. These are proteins, misfolded proteins, that kind of um, keep misfolding on their own. They're kind of self-organizing, but in the wrong direction. And, um, and uh, so I think that's probably what got on with this, with this lady. And here, the striking sign, with, look at the MRI here. It's really, the first thing I'll, I'll say, this is a three month story. Remember a three month story? The ventricles are quite enlarged, which tells you that there's been a loss, a lot of loss of nerve cells and their connections uh, around here. That's why the brain is shrunk. That's why the ventricles are enlarged. But the other thing is that the signal increase here is in the basal ganglia here and in the thalamus here. So it kind of lights up here. This is almost pathognomonic of the spongiform encephalopathy uh, caused by a prion. And you can see the disease actually affecting the, cere the cerebellum here. So here's an example of, um, of a disorder. By the way, this is related to bovine encephalopathy that's sometimes transmitted to humans. And um, so it's, uh, and by the way, it's very difficult to kill this, uh, if you like, it's not a bug, but bug. Uh, with standard measures. It, it's really quite tricky. Um, and, uh, and some surgeons have got it by operating on somebody with this disease and they cut their glove. And, um, and then they pick up the, whatever it is, the agent. Um, now here's a, here's a teaching case really, because um, aside from the spelling mistake at the top, I just noticed it right now, but here's case 10. Uh, a 70 year old man um, with a depressed mood, unsteady walking and urinary incontinence. I mean, that's, that's the overall story. Now I'll tell you, this person had a long history, he's 70 years old now, had a 50 year history of uh, psychiatric disease characterized by obsessive compulsive disorder and, uh, and depression. And uh, to the point of uh, trying to commit suicide several times. And uh, so in the books, this was considered strictly a psychiatric problem. 10 years ago, he had a, an episode of irritability. Um, 
he couldn't, uh, uh, you know, he, he was kind of wakeful most of the time, didn't want to go to sleep. And he had these feelings of transcendence and being at one with God. So this bizarre uh, uh, thought disorder. Um, and then uh, beginning shortly after that, a history of falls. And one of them, uh, he had um, some back pain afterwards and some weakness in his legs and incontinence. Now, if I just heard those, those two lines, I would wonder, gee, what happened to the, to the uh, lumbosacral nerve roots? And was there a large disc or a compression fracture? There was something that happened because incontinence, uh, that really requires uh, nerve root trouble on both sides and some, something right in the center of the spinal canal. Anyway, rightly or wrongly, um, I think they looked for that. But then five years ago, the beginning of some memory loss. And then um, it, uh, some findings on admission of, uh, remember I mentioned this just a minute, minute, several minutes ago, this Parkinsonian-like, these Parkinsonian people reduce facial expression. And, um, and his, uh, his walking was described as, uh, as magnetic, almost glued to the floor quality and shuffling. That kind of walking is commonly associated with, uh, with frontal lobe problem. And, um, and, but he obviously has uh, some changes in tone and, and uh, there are other motor abnormalities here, brisk reflexes in his legs. Anyway, so, Here's this long story going back to his 20s of primarily a psychiatric disorder. And he has a fall at some point, uh, nine years ago, and, um, and the first of this incontinence. But it doesn't seem to register. He keeps going to psychiatric clinics and seeing psychiatrists. And, um, and um, somewhere along the line, uh, relatively recently, um, he, he saw some other people and they had a different take on this. And this is a, this is a, this is a problem that uh, I first saw in the mid 1965 or 1966 in Toronto where um, one of the, the residents won up the staff person because the resident had read the most recent issue of the New England Journal of Medicine and recognize the syndrome right off the bat. And, um, and, um, and uh, so this is, uh, this is what's called normal pressure hydrocephalus. So what happens in this, there's a triad here, uh, the cognitive impairment, difficulty walking and incontinence. And, and, um, and the giveaway of course, if you do the CAT scan or an MRI scan, you find large ventricles. But the real clue is you put a lumbar puncture needle in and drain off a bunch of spinal fluid. And I remember looking after a, uh, a head of a legal firm in Boston with, with not, without the psychiatric history here, but a several year history of on again, off again, but slowly progressive um, cognitive impairment to the point where, um, where his, uh, his, his work was being affected and his clients were seeking other legal help. And, um, and he, but he had this triad. And, um, and I remember uh, saying, gee, well, we'll, uh, we'll put a lumbar puncture thing and let's just see. I, I can tell you the CAT scan showed that large ventricles. It was remarkable. See, within days, this guy who is really quite impaired um, was walking better, facial expression had come back, and, um, and the other cognitive functions were. So 
around the two-week mark, he was almost normal. And that's what happened here. Now, there's the, the CAT scan in, in this particular case. And it shows these large ventricles here. Uh, you say, well, gee, how, how did this actually happen? What, 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 what actually caused it? Well, we don't actually know. But some of these people um, might have a history of a minor, uh, of a minor head injury uh, or a fall, kind of banged their head a little bit, forgot about it. Um, and they had a little bleeding in the subarachnoid space, which kind of plugged up the absorption system of the spinal fluid, forcing the back pressure and the enlargement of ventricle. And, um, and, and, um, and that seems to be what's that. So if you, if you drain off the, the, the spinal fluid and um, it, it, uh, it, it's, really, it's one of those few times in, um, in, in neuroscience where you get a really dramatic improvement for such a simple thing to be done. And all you really need to do is think about it. Um, so, uh, so that worked. Now I'm ending on this one because, because of the importance of home-based uh, exercises, uh, and especially for the, the trunk muscles and the hip girdle muscles and the thigh muscles, especially those. And um, uh, I, 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 it really pays huge dividends. Uh, now you need. I wouldn't consider this a particularly safe exercise. <laughs> the guy, he's right at the edge of the, of the, of the chair here. But anyway, the point is uh, that, um, that Miriam Nelson, those books of Miriam Nelson, by the way, she wrote about five of those things. The first one is the best. So you can uh, go to Amazon and check it out. In fact, I think the library here, or probably most libraries, have, uh, have some copies of her stuff. The, the beauty is, doesn't matter where you are on sailing around Australia or traveling in Europe or whatever, you can do those exercises in your hotel room or wherever it is, you can take it with you. It's like running, it goes with you with, uh, with the running shoes or walking, you can walk any, everywhere. So, um, that, that's the beauty of this. That's what made it so effective for women in their 80s and 90s. So uh, something, something to think about. And then I like this. Don't you like this one? Undergrowth with two figures, Vincent Van Gogh. So there you are, that's the art lesson for the day. Oh, this is the slide from the patient with the prion disease. This is the pathology. And they call it spongiform encephalopathy for a reason, because you get these uh, a myriad of these little holes like Swiss cheese in, in, in the brain. See all the little white spots all over the place? Those are places where cells have been, have died and uh, or nerve fibers lost, they're gone. So it just leaves all these holes in the brain and uh, which and why it's been called as a spongiform encephalopathy. So um, on that note, um, oh, why am I doing this? Uh, we're not going to do this. We'll go back to where we were. So um, uh, are there any questions? Oh, uh, and on the comment thing uh, about the info health program, about times, days, times, you know, what I find with, with info health sometimes in good weather, you can't blame people. Why would they want to be inside at some presentation when it's lovely outside? So what, what often seems to work, a uh, better time would be late, late morning, but that's only my thought. And um, so just, uh, we'll, we'll kind of vote electronically. And, um, but it is once a month. And, um, and then don't forget the Nobel series that starts up again in, uh, in late October, or early November. And then we may have the, uh, the, um, 
art and science series in between those. We, 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 we will see. So it's, uh, it's busy. Um, so any, any questions, any thoughts? No, you're mute. You muted yourself. <laughs> All right. Ready? You can just oh. unmute yourself if you have a question. Okay. We do we have to register? Excuse me. Do we have to register for each session of the info help? Yes. Yeah. It's not a. It's not a lecture series. So I will. And because it's only once a month. So. Um, but hopefully, like right now, I've got the June one up already, so you can register for that one already. Um, and then going forward tentatively, Dr. Brown and I have discussed going through the summer. We don't generally go through the summer, but this year is different somehow. And I felt that we all need something to do. Um, so yes, it'll be coming monthly, but I'm hoping to do it the first, the first Wednesday of the month, generally. Um, but as far as even timing of day, uh, boy, I wish I had thought of this sooner. I could have put a poll up quickly and had you guys do one. Um, I'm thinking of in for July, were you gonna do one in August too, Dr. Brown? Yeah, 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 yeah? sure. Okay, so definitely for the summer going through July and August of doing it like later in the morning, that gives you the rest of the day and evening. If it's a nice evening, nobody wants to come in and sit in front of a screen. Afternoon, same thing. So um, unless I hear otherwise, um, Let's try yeah. July and August about, I'm thinking about 11 o'clock, but look yeah. online and yeah, you'll have to write. I would, I would book that. I would like that. Yes, that'd be better. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's do that. And if, you know, if we really like that, we can always go forward with that too. Um, and they're on YouTube. Again. It is always on YouTube. So Christine will always put it on YouTube. So yeah. if you have to miss it, you can always watch it that way. But then okay. we don't get to have a chit chat like we are right now. Yeah. Um, so Francis asked, do you suggest learning the Epley maneuver or asking the help of a professional? Dr. Brown? Well, I think um, my thoughts is at least, um, I think it was, it was the some family physician know about the Epley maneuver and how to do it. But heaven knows if you go to, if you Google it, It'll march you right through it, and it's on YouTube as well. So, um, so it's not hard to come up with uh, with the Epley maneuver. And the nice thing about it is it travels with you, and your smartphone. Um, and it's it's it it works with the nine positional vertical. It it um, it's it's amazing. Uh, it, uh, thank goodness for Epley. Anything else? I don't see anything else in the chat. Okay. Is there right. anyone else I would like to ask a question directly? Yeah, no. Just pop yourself. Okay. Well, I'm not gonna ask myself any questions. <laughs> I might not you have the answer. stump yourself? Yeah, That's well, I might not have the answer. Janet, do you have a question? Oh. Do you it's see? Dr. Yep. Brown, do you see the book that Janet is holding up? Um, do I see what? The book. Janet is holding up a book. It's called Strong Women Stay oh, Young. Yeah. Stay, stay Young. There we are. There you Strong go. Strong Women Stay Young. Yeah. Amazon. Yeah, Amazon. Yeah. It's a, the thing I like about it, it I mean, it's pretty pro, prosaic, but it actually works. The, the, the data is there. It, it actually does work. And um, and it was a really well done study and it's doable without fancy equipment or, and these days with COVID without a gym. So that's gotta be a huge plus. Um, I think, uh, uh, I think that, you know, I, I, if um, Miriam Nelson is quite, quite the, uh, the the energetic person. I mean, she, the USDA building in Boston had 14 floors and she used to run up the stairs right to the top a couple of times a day to get her exercise in. But uh, 
Uh, I mean, you can do more, but the point is that even with that simple program that, she, that they have outlined in that book, and by the way, it's, it's not a product of her, it's a product of those three universities. There were a lot of people involved with that. Um, with that simple program and, and uh, her illustrations of for what to do, um, that's the, what produced the 20 to 50% increases in in, in, in strength in people in their 80s and 90s. That's pretty impressive, I think, uh, within, within a month or so. And um, uh, I, I, you know, it, it's such an easily done thing. I, I was struck, been thinking about the, this, the work up to this uh, program and thinking how much you could actually do in your home and I've started incorporating a whole bunch of that stuff myself. Not, not necessarily from her stuff, but I mean, there's stuff you could do with the sink and uh, almost anywhere in the home that, that um, and one of the tricks, by the way, wh when you're doing it, some of this stuff is, uh, is just to remember to kind of snug up your tummy uh, mm -hmm. all the time. That, so almost any activity you're, you're doing, whether you're kind of, Kind of hopping side to side, or, or just with your feet in constant contact, but you're running on the spot. Um, just think about it and snug up your core muscles and keep them there. Just so you think about it, it that makes a huge difference. Uh, but by the way, it uh, it gets rid of the bad fat too, but that hormonally active fat uh, that's not the subcutaneous fat. It's, uh, it's the bad stuff. So, so just incorporating that in stuff you do makes quite a difference. So um, anyway, uh, um, I, I think uh, sometimes it very much depends on, but I, it, it, sometimes it's helpful to have a personal trainer, but gee, it's so hard to find one that kind of fits in with, with you and, uh, that kind of sort of work with you and and that where it's convenient. Um, sometimes it's helpful if, if you know if it were two or three women or two or three guys working with one trainer at at the same time in, in somebody's home. That that really works. The, the minute you have to move this stuff out to some exercise facility is uh, is an inconvenience. As far as I'm concerned, and and you want to learn something that you can do, that you can take with you wherever you go. So even if you're on an airplane, and you're seated and you're seated, you can still do training. I mean, if you just extend your legs and push up against the seat in front of you, uh, you can isometrically contract your your quadriceps. And if you uh, if the resistance comes in the forefoot. You're actually training the muscles below your knee, between the ankle and, and the knee. Um, that so you can be a manager or kind of spread your your legs apart and 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 uh, resist it with the arms. Now you're training the arms and the legs. Uh, so if you're a little imaginative about this stuff, you can train a lot watching TV. Uh, you may not be doing much for your brain, but you're doing a lot for your muscle. So it's uh, something something to think about. Um, anyway, um, I, it, it, it might be worthwhile sometime, maybe not as part of the main session, actually going through something like that because I, I, I'm really struck with how much you can do. And I think Miriam Nelson kind of tapped into that, but I think you could actually go a lot further than, than she did um, with no weights at all. Uh, you don't need weight. You, you, you weigh, you already weigh something. And, uh, and that resistance acts like a weight. So um, anyway, it's something to think about. We might do that because uh, that, that, that would work out actually. Particularly, anyway, it's something that, that's occurred to me during this COVID time because the gyms are closed. And uh, then just try to be a little creative for your time. And uh, 
I mean, you could do other things while you're actually doing this stuff. So um, I, I think that's that's uh, that's a really good thing. I, I don't know that I'm going to miss going back to the gym, frankly. Uh, so uh, any other thoughts? No. No. Okay. Well, no, I think we now have to go and work out a little bit. Yeah. Well, uh, you've. That, that's right. That's right. But I think we all need a little uh, guidance about what, what to do or some thoughts about what to do. And, and that, that, but I've tried to give you a few tips it's with a little imagination. When you're sitting, seated in that airplane for seven hours going to Europe, uh, with a risk of, uh, of uh, thrombosis and various other things, uh, possibility, you can actually do something about that. And, uh, and uh, so anyway, some thoughts. All right. So we'll see you uh, next month. See you next month, so, everybody. It's, up, yeah. it's online. All so right. please register. All right. Bye-bye.